Am I am I actually on? Yeah. Sweet. <laughs> Hello, Internet. Uh, <laughs> this is Philip Kidd, and we're here at BK Makerspace, uh, and we're meeting for the uh, Tulsa Open Source Hardware meeting here in March, right? Yeah, March. Um, I'm told there's a there's a pre spiel I have to read here, so I'm gonna go about it. So, um, Tech uh, Techlahoma is the organization that gives us uh, a lot of the funding for these meetups. Um, Let's see, you can check out uh, the, I'm at the Tulsa Web Devs uh, task wiki here, so you can check this page out, and there's lots of stuff for the Tulsa Web Devs meeting, but we're using this for ours as well. Um, you can check out the Techlahoma Help Wanted board. Um, there's lots of ways to help support Techlahoma, Amazon Smile, subscribing on Twitch, donating one time or monthly. We especially like monthly donations. Uh, getting a license plate, that just came out. Are those actually available now? Like you can you can do the application. Yeah, you can apply now. Yeah. And, but you have to apply by paper. Yes, you have to apply by paper. Even though it says on the paper that you can drop them off at the tech agency, you cannot. And you must write a check, and it must be on the name. The check must be written to the name of the person who holds the stamp. Right. I assume this this link here will give you more information. So I would follow through it, and and you can get it there. Um, we also accept sponsorships, and we have a store where you can buy merch. Ah, yes, and yeah, there's a there's a required limit, but I think we've nearly reached that, somebody said. I don't know. That's what I heard. Um, <laughs> right, so there's lots of upcoming meetings, and you can check them out here. Um, um, oh, yeah. So, right. Um, Techlahoma, uh, or we're here thanks to our sponsors. Um, well, Project Make It for doing the stream, um, uh, BNK Makerspace for over in the space, um, and volunteer speakers and Techlahoma. What is Techlahoma? Techlahoma is a nonprofit volunteer run organization that puts on over 30 monthly meetups, two annual conferences, and sponsors free local events. Please be sure to read our code of conduct and reach out to somebody on the conduct committee if you feel there's been a violation of the code of conduct. And uh, yeah, I think we'll get along, get on with the rest of the meeting. There's lots of other information here, um, and there's tons of other you know, meetups and stuff you can find on meetup.com, all of that. All right, now you can ignore my desktop there for a second. God knows what was on that. It's immortalized on the internet now. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, really ti tiny, teeny, teeny, teeny little letters. Um, right. Okay, so um, today we're going to talk about um, CAD CAM in Fusion 360. And the reason we picked Fusion 360 is one, it's free. Um, at least free for hobbyists and uh, um, makers and things like that. Uh, and two, it has a great CAM software, which works well with the CNC we have here at the Makerspace. Um, I was showing, before we actually started streaming, a quick simulation of a cut that I'd made um, to do a little sign here at the space. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Actually, we can just turn the speedway up and it'll keep doing its thing. So there you go. That was real fast. <laughs> um, right? I don't think that was the whole cut either. But uh, anyway, so yeah, so it's got a nice simulation tool and a bunch of other stuff. So we're going to go through and do a very, very quick and simple um, design just as an example. And uh, that's what we'll do on the stream. We'll do the CAD and CAM part. And then we're going to go over, the people who are here at the space are going to go over to the uh, CNC machine and cut it out. So we're not going to do a lot of complicated cuts. We're going to pick a couple of simple cuts, and then we'll go over there and run it through with some sort of material, which I will find in the scrap. Uh, okay, so uh, for those of you who are new to Fusion 360, you might be used to things like Blender and things like that, where the first thing you're likely to start with is a cube or some sort of sculpting tool or something like that. Fusion 360 relies almost entirely on sketches and extrusions for 3D. So, for example, if we want to just quickly create a box, um, we can sketch a two-point rectangle and pick a length. The nice thing is um, if you want to size it, you can either drag it using the mouse or you can be like, oh, actually I want 50 millimeters by 50 millimeters, bam. And you just type it in, use the keyboard. Um, and now these, these constraints are set here. So we can double click this and you know change it to 100. And now we have 100 by 50. So if we wanted to make this and add some more interest to it, 
Um, we'll just real quick create like a nice little post hole there. Maybe we're gonna put something through there, make it 25. Um, that's only an inch, isn't it? This isn't very big. All right, let's just uh, make this a little bigger. So, uh, well, wow, uh, let me make that quite big. There we go. Um, and it will it'll snap to grid nicely. There's also you know changes where you can go in here and change the snap to grid settings and all of that. Uh, we'll make this guy 100 just so that he's big enough so that doing too many complicated things. And then we'll add a thing here. So now we've got a sketch built. Um, in order to make a 3D, um, a uh, 3D model from this, we would extrude part of the, the sketch. So if we stop our sketch, we can select part of this and do a press pull and just we'll make that a little bit bigger. Oops, not that part. Uh, and then as soon as you do that to the first time on a sketch, the sketch disappears. So you have to show the sketch again so that you can actually see what you used to have. Oh. Um, typically, you're only going to do like a press pull. It's the 90% the, the, the case is you're going to do a sketch, pull it out, and be done with it. Um, but a lot of times I'll generate or I'll have a sketch with multiple parts that I'll want to raise to different heights. So um, I think that default can be changed, uh, but it's... It is what it is. So um, you can raise different parts of your design to different heights. Um, and then if, for example, I don't want this to be this hard angle, and because I'm being contrary today, I'm not going to use something like a chamfer or something like that. Uh, I want to sketch something, but I want to sketch it such that we're going to cut something out, and I'd want to do it on the side. You can use the side as the plane of your sketch. So normally we would select a plane to draw the sketch on. We can also draw the sketch on the part itself. And so I could go here and then we'll add a, say a circle um, and extend it. And it should snap to your design as well. So it's snapping to this corner here. Um, so we can then do that. And then we can take this, actually this piece is the piece we care about. And if we just go like that, it will, assuming you're going through another part, it will assume you want to cut out of that part, um, which isn't always a perfect assumption to make, but typically that's what you're going to be doing. Um, you can change that over here with the operation. So we could say join, which is just going to make it be exactly like it was before, um, intersect, which would cut everything but where it touches, or the default, which is just a cut. So that will cut us out that nice inverse corner. Yes, so you, that would be join. But since I only selected that section of it, it's not a change. But if I were to do this, now that's all going to be one model post uh, extrude. Uh, but we'll just do a cut because doing these kind of inverse corners is an interesting thing to do in CAM. So it'll give us something, some interest to this part. Um, so there we go. We've got a nice little curve there. We can do things like... Um, do fillets and chamfers. If you right click, there's a lot of shortcuts here. You can also do them through the modify menu up top. So we'll just do a quick fillet of say, I don't know, create a cool looking inverse thing there. And then just cause I can't leave things just being straight here. I'm just gonna do a quick fillet of like, I don't know, there we go. Oh, as in you want to make like a, an angle piece yeah. here? Um, actually, that's a great idea. And let's do something crazy. Um, let's do it after the fact, but leave all the fillets in. So we're going to add a line here um, to this sketch. And we're just going to kind of, is this what you were thinking? Yeah. Kind of make an angle there? Yeah. Okay. So we'll do that. And then... 
you can include existing lines, but I'm lazy, so I'm going to recreate them in my sketch. Um, so you can you can actually use parts of this model as part of your sketch. I recreated them in the sketch because I've had weird issues with changing things in the past. But Okay, so now um, we've done that. Let's stop our sketch. Nothing has changed yet, but we're going to go back and change our extrude here where we created that after the fact. So we'll add this to our extrude, which will cut that off. And now, when we say OK, it's going to hate me. Dang it. Um, sometimes that will just work. <laughs> yeah, it, it actually was probably that my fillets were now too big. And so it physically couldn't do the fillet. Um, but we're just adding some faces to our existing fillet. That one, that one, that one. We'll take that face and that face. So one of the cool things, and I think we had slightly, uh, we had a design that did not support it there. But one of the cool things is you can go back in history, modify your model, and it will update history to make up for that fact. Um, you can also create parameters in your design. Um, I think that is... I always have to look it up. But there's a way to create parameters, and you can then modify those, and your entire design will update to match those new parameters. Uh, yeah, well, and those parameters can also reference other parameters, and you can do formulas anywhere, really. Um, so, yeah. I mean, you can do things like, I'm designing for material, but I haven't bought the material yet, so I don't know how thick my plywood is for the side of my desk. So I'm going to design the desk, put in the thickness as a, as a parameter, and then let the rest of it update as a result. Because like your, your joins will be slightly different depending on the thickness of your material and stuff like that. So you can build your design to adapt to changes yeah. with it within a reasonable range. Exactly. Well, or in this case, your tools, right? Because you may not support if the, the smallest tool I had when I did my first cut on this thing was a quarter inch bit. So my holes could not be any smaller than a quarter inch because the bit physically wouldn't fit in them. Um, and in fact, if you look at the sign out front, you can see where it couldn't get into some of the corners because the bit's too big. So, right. So we've created a very simple model here. Now we can go through a lot more and make some more complicated models. But we've got kind of an interesting model with some flats, with some curved bits. Um, so we've got all sorts of interest here. So we're going to go over to, we were in the model section. This is all the creating basic stuff. You can also do um, sculpting if you're a more traditional sculptor uh, or 3D modeler. But it's harder to do some of the cam stuff with sculpted models from what I understand. I haven't done much of the sculpting stuff in Fusion. Um, so we're going to go over to manufacture. Um, it also has a cool simulation thing where you can simulate joints and stuff and do all sorts of crazy machines in here. We're going to skip straight to manufacture. So the first thing you do when you get over to manufacture is you actually need a new setup. So we're going to do a new setup. Um, we're going to do milling because that's what our CNC is. There are several other options. You can do turning um, if you have a CNC lathe. Um, there's also cutting, which is apparently a water jet, laser, or plasma. Um, and it can generate G-code in all sorts of different ways. And the G-code post-processor is not for the faint of heart, but you can make your own post-processor. Um, I've looked at the code. It's scary, but it's possible to change that however you want. I think it's it. I don't know what language it's in. It's either Perl or Python. It's one of the P ones. Yes, yeah, this supports STL, upgrade, or STL exports. In fact, um, here, let me pop back over to model real quick. Um, exporting as STL is really simple. If you just go to the root here, uh, you just say save as STL. And then um, you tell it what format. Binary is fine. Pretty much all the defaults are fine for like Slicer or any of the 3D printing programs. Um, and then hit OK and then put in a name. Um. 
I'm pretty sure it does. It has a refinement options here. So I have it set to medium by default, which I don't think I've changed any of these options. Um, so yeah, if you have like really ultra curved and fine surfaces, you may need to go more complicated, especially like spheres and long curves where you don't want those edges to show up. All right, we'll pop back over to manufacturing. And you can also go from manufacturing back to model, mod modify your model, come back to manufacturing, and it will show you like it did when we were in model where it was like, okay, your timeline is broken because now I don't have the surface I was referring to when I was doing this. So we've done our setup. Let's just take a look, or we didn't do it. We actually didn't click okay. So milling is the default, which is what we're gonna be doing. Um, our orientation is important um, because our, in the case of our um, CNC machine, Z is up. And obviously, Z is not up right now. Um, and X and Y are the side-to-side the -side angles. Those don't really matter as much as the Z angle matters. Uh, now I have to remember how to do that. Um, right. Origin, orientation. Okay. So we want to... Select the z-axis, or we can just select the x and y axes. So we'll just use a line here. So we'll say that's the x-axis, and that's the y-axis. So now our z-axis is up. The other two are not super important. Is that backwards from the way it is? Or is this way? Yeah, it is. X is reversed. So we want to flip x. <laughs> and it flipped C. It's it's super super fun, isn't it? <laughs> super fun. Um, yeah. Yeah, our part will be backwards on the y-axis, but I don't think we care that much. So you can mess around with this. There's there's other ways to do it where you select the Z. Um. Join us. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, okay, so we've, we've oriented our part. There's lots more you can do to orient here um, and get the orientation exactly the way you want. Um, we will select the origin, and I'm going to pick one of the corners um, just because that's easier for me to reason about, but it doesn't matter as much. It matters if your stock is very close to the size of your part so that you have to worry about you know, getting it exactly inside the stock. Um, so that's where we'll go next is the stock. So when you're doing stock setup, um, it depends on how, what kind of stock you have, what kind of wood you're dealing with or plastic or metal or whatever. Um, I'm going to go with a fixed size box. Um, and I am going to do, let's see. If we did like a two by four, ah, screw it. Oh, crap. Did I just, yay. I just hit escape. That's awesome. I'm going to have to start all the way over. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's an option. Um, I have to do this in my head every time. Sorry for the people on the stream. I'm imagining in my head the CNC and the direction that the axes go just so that I can get this right. So... Right? Yeah, that'll do. Uh, that's actually right. Okay, cool. Um, you can actually do all sorts of crazy fixture stuff where you can actually like import a model of the shape of the CNC, including the, the uh, Z clearance, which is actually important. We only have, we have roughly six inches of CNC uh, gantry clearance. Uh, technically, there's eight, but you don't want to count on eight given that there's a spoil board. Your part isn't going to be exactly flush with the bottom. Um, so you want to make sure that you leave yourself a little bit of wiggle room with that. Um, I'm actually going to leave the stock settings default. I was going to go through and like model the stock, but I think we're going to skip that just for, for the sake of it's going to be different depending on whatever it is you make. How thick is that? Three quarters. Three quarters. Oh, nice. I don't know how thick my, I don't think my part is that thick. Um, We'll we'll measure it before we before we go. I think my um, if I do a fixed size box, which is now this is perfectly hugging it, 
my height is only 40 millimeters, which is, that's a little over an inch, isn't it? Yeah, it's almost two inches, isn't it? Okay, so we've made our part too tall. Um, we can also cut it out of something else. So um, we'll go with something, but I'm just going to keep going through this. So um, our post process, we're just going to leave all this default because we'll change that when we get to the G-code generation part. So I'm going to hit OK. Now we get into the interesting part where we actually choose how we want to mill this thing out. Um, the first thing we should do is face the part. Um, so we're going to do a face operation, which is just clean the top of your material off because often the surface of your material isn't great, um, especially when you're dealing with metal, there'll be some you know imperfections in the surface. If you're dealing with wood, often there'll be little nick marks and things like that, and you wanna work that off. So we're just gonna essentially cut the top off. We're gonna select a tool. Um, in this case, I am going to use a, let's see, I believe I have a, um, is that a half inch? It's a half inch. Yeah, that is not what I meant to do. Uh, there we go. Uh, inch aluminum. And we'll just go down this way. So we're gonna find a half inch flat. Um, we're gonna use that as our tool. And it's gonna expect to go there. Um, so if we just real quick go to here, hit the simulate. And every time you do the simulate, you wanna go up to your setup first because otherwise it will only simulate the one operation. Um, and uh, it will do that as if no other operations have occurred, um, which will often make your stock look very strange in the simulation. So it's going to do what we expected. Um, it's not actually going to remove any material. This is just making sure there aren't any extra bits left over. So if our stock was a slightly bigger than we said it was or whatever, it's just going to clear the top off. Trim any, yeah, any bits that are sticking out or whatever, it's gonna it's gonna clear that off. Okay, so that's our first operation is we're just facing it. Oops, turn the simulation off, close, there we go. All right, so we have a face operation. So the next thing we want to do is clear this area. And since we've now made it nice and complicated because it's not, a, there are no flat surfaces on this, um, we're not going to do the 2D stuff. Um, actually, we may do a 2D, we'll do a 2D pocket of this guy because we can. Uh, no, I don't want to do a face. Uh, so we'll do a just adaptive clearing and we'll do that. Uh, our tool will be probably not the half inch flat. Um, so instead we will use, I think I've got a quarter inch in there. Um, that's nice and simple to use. So we'll just switch over to a quarter inch. Um, we have that. This is your height. So I'm gonna, oops, that's not the thing I wanted to use. And which shift. So used to my setup at home, it's difficult. So the heights tells you the retract distance, uh, where, where you want it to clear. So if it's going and making a big movement, this is the clear height here. And then the top is where it considers the top of the material to be. Now, um, there's actually some settings you can change here where it will, it will keep, it, keep track of previous movements and use the top from those movements. Um, you can also manually change the top. Because uh, right now it's gonna assume the top is up here because it's going to be. We haven't done any of that clearing. We're gonna clear this pocket from the top all the way down. Um, you can tell it what passes to use and how to enter the the piece um how you want to how much stock you want to leave so this is going to be a rough cut um, we're not going to do a finishing cut with this we're just going to rough cut it real quick um and then how you link in which is how you how you enter and leave the cut so there's a transition there's a lead in and a lead out and all of that there's a whole bunch of options here we're just going to leave the default because it will be fine probably 
Um, so it's going to enter in. It's going to do this crazy helix thing. And then it's going to do this adaptive clear where it tries to keep the tool engaged 100% of the time, which is nice. So uh, typically the thing you don't want to do is, is have the bit go in and out of a cut because it's really rough on the whole setup. You want it to be constantly engaged with... with it's going to helical this way, right in the center. You can't see this on the camera, but it's okay. Unless, unless Blake switches the camera. But it's going to do a, a kind of a helical like thing a, in. A tornado right, a tornado shape. And then it's going to spread out slowly in a circle. Um, so, in fact, so it's actually going to take advantage of far from like I can show you. Yeah, so that, that's what we were going to, I was going to show is how badly this order is going to yeah. screw up our cut. We can't do what we just set it up to do. It's not going to like that. Um, I mean, it'll try. <laughs> so, so yeah. See, do you see how that turned red? That's bad. <laughs> that means the tool head is crashing into our model. You never want that to happen. So <laughs> we're going to have to add another cut in the middle of those to clear that extra stuff away. So it's How come I can't think about that? Why, why is it only missing for like, So now we don't necessarily need to. We could do something like a 3D adaptive clearing that would just figure it out. But you typically want to go with the, the simplest um, cam operation you can for a given cut rather than go the most complicated. Because you can go straight to, in fact, here, I'll just show you. We'll just, um, now nah, we'll just leave it. Um, we'll add a 3D adaptive clearing. Um, and I'm just going to leave it at the default. I'm not even going to change anything. I'm just going to hit OK. And this thing is going to take a little bit, take a little while to calculate this tool path that it's creating. And it should basically do the entire cut. <laughs> right uh there's a lot of operation here so let's just so i'm going to move him up to there he's gonna have to recalculate because i just moved him in the tree or he's not going to do anything oh no no he was happy with just moving i think he's not taking the other guy into account so i'm gonna delete this guy just because we don't need him and we can always recreate him um, okay, so let's do a quick simulate of that guy. And I think, go to next operation. Okay, so this operation is, as you can see, it's only cutting a little bit off of the edge rather than going like aggressively into the center and clearing. Um, 2D and 3D adaptive have different strategies for how they deal with the model. The 2D tends to come from the outside and, and clear as much as it can because it's going to go over the entire surface of the part rather than um, go into a specific part. So you may have a much less efficient tool path if you do a 3D adaptive clear. We'll probably use this because it's the simplest way to do this. We just get, say do a giant 3D adaptive clear. Um, I'll move it much faster. So it'll clear that out, and then it'll do another one. And it'll continually basically cut these out, and it's starting to cut the centerpiece. And Of course, we can't see anything because it's all the same color, and it's not a particularly great 3D model. Um, but as you can see, now we're done, and it didn't fully clear everything because I, I told it to leave some material. So we've still got a little bit of a hole there. You can't see it. So we do need now another cut to finish it up. Um, what we can do is take this guy. Oops. Oops. Oh, right. Close. So don't, don't try and do stuff in simulation. It doesn't work. Um, so we can take this guy and we can create a, uh, a finishing path from this guy. So we can create a derived. Um, there's a way to create a quick finish path from an existing path. Um, a while since I've done this. Well, we're just going to duplicate him. And this guy, we're going to do some different things. Um, we're not going to leave any stock. And I 
think that's basically it. There's usually a like finishing check. Oh yeah, yeah. That's um, so. There's a tolerance here. We can lower the tolerance if we want. It's honestly fine. Um, you've got optimal load. You've got fine step down, which is the um, yeah. But yeah, so we can we can change all of those. I think just by taking the stock to leave off, we should be fine here. Um, you can change lots of individual settings to get you know slightly better accuracy or something in a pass, but. We'll go with this. So if we hit OK now, we're going to get yet another long processing time where it builds this new operation. And then if we simulate the whole thing, we'll get what we hope is a, a much cleaner finish. Oh, I didn't, I didn't include previous cuts. Yep. So it's trying to clear it as if the entire stock still existed, um, which is going to do an awful lot of cuts that we don't need. Um, so we don't want to do that. We want to, where's the magic setting? Um, oh, good Lord. Is it this one? Um, well, it's not tool, it might be geometry. Oh man, every time I can't find this and I have to go look it up. Um, source from previous operations, there's the magic. Um, so we changed the source. So instead of from setup stock, which is the full stock, we changed it from previous operations, which means it will essentially simulate the previous operations and then only cut what's left. So now our finishing pass isn't going to take nearly as long because it only has to do that last little couple of layers of cutting. So we should see a much simpler, simpler for some definition of simple, um, cut. Although I don't think it's gonna, I don't think it's gonna go all the way down. Still, I think we need to make an adjustment there. No, maybe it will. Okay, so. Now, if we go back and yet again simulate, um, we'll skip the first two operations because we know what those look like. And now we can simulate this last operation, which should, um, a quick look here, and we'll just speed it up a little bit because we don't want to be here all night waiting for it to simulate. And it's going to cut everywhere it thinks it needs to. And it's still left some Z stock, so what did we? I think there's a separate Z stock. To, no, I think we, ah, god dang it. I keep forgetting to close simulate. Yeah, let's, uh, let's take a look. That we're, we're on the 3D adaptive clear, but I think instead we want to do something like Contour, ramp, um, you can do a scallop, a spiral. So there's lots of different patterns you can use. Um, probably morph spiral would be the one we want to try. Um, and then we'll go again, um, rest machining will turn on from previous operation. Um, and then we are not gonna leave any stock. Our tolerance is very, very low. And we'll hit OK. So we're going to add lots of passes. We're, we're just getting super fine in here with these passes. Uh, and it hates this. What doesn't it like? Empty tool path. Yeah, it doesn't like that morph spiral. OK. And we probably cut too much off. Um, but honestly, it's probably good enough as far as the surface goes for our demonstration. Um, we can get into lots of other things. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to clear out that middle section using a 2D path now. Now that we've cleared all the stuff out of the way, we can use that simple 2D path um, and not have to worry quite so much about, actually we don't need rest machining for a 2D path. Um, not have to worry quite so much about knocking into the uh, 
into the uh, tool. Yeah. Anyway, so we'll do that guy. Now we can do our last simulate. Um, I'm going to skip the operations we've seen many, many times now. And then this guy's going to go in and do a kind of unnecessary helix all the way down through the piece. And then he'll clear out the last of the material. And we should end up with a relatively smooth piece. So we've created a fairly simple piece. Um, that's interesting. Just, uh, yeah, so you'll notice we do have a problem. It looks like our, whoa, what is happening? It looks like our tool path or our, our uh, tool still rammed in there. Yeah. Yeah, pro it'll probably be close enough that I don't want to risk that. Oh, just just simple. Make the model to where it it fits the. Yeah, yeah. Hey, let's do it. I like it. It will actually recalculate everything, which is gonna be super fun. But that's all right. So we're just gonna make our fillets bigger. Is what we're gonna do. Um, let's make our fillets much bigger. Let me try a ten. Does it hates that? It's too big. Um, so instead. Let's see, how do we want to do that? I would say let's just change our original, our original um, extrusion here and not make it quite so tall. Um, we'll go down to... Yeah, that works. That's even weirder. Um, if you don't end up getting rid of all your material, how do you mean? No, Cat is gonna or Cam is gonna assume that you need to figure out how that works, okay. um, and it's gonna leave that to you. I'm gonna delete this fillet because honestly, it's just making more problems than anything. Um, <laughs> simplify our lives here. I don't know why I left that like that. Oh, because that's it. So it, when we when we changed the model a lot, it was like, oh, that circle was actually over here, right, guys? And so it tried to it tried to adapt the model, and obviously that didn't work. Um, so see how it moved our circle all the way down here because it it was like oh that vertex is now this vertex and it tried to adapt so it doesn't always get it exactly right but this is also fine so let's go over to our machining and see just how much we've screwed ourselves up um, yep it hates everything um, where did our model oh right I, I hit our model um, so let's just try regenerating everything and see what happens What's nice is these all should regenerate relatively easily because they were 3D cuts. Um, so they should be able to figure it out relatively easily. So let's just give it a second while we all sit here and enjoy this loading screen. I feel like I'm playing Anthem. Are we already playing Anthem? No, I, I feel like I am. Well, you are playing Anthem. Yeah, I, I own a copy of it. <laughs> So it was a cultural reference joke. Yeah. Didn't work. It's all right. Uh, <laughs> I do. I, you know what? I enjoy the game. <laughs> Might be an unpopular opinion, but I do. Okay. So let's see what our, uh, what our new clear strategy looks like. Right. All right, again, not perfect, but now we don't have any head crashes, which is great um, for my equipment and also for our sanity. Uh, and I also made it much thinner, so we should be able to get away with using hopefully a, a piece of uh, foam or something like that. So our thoroughly useless model is now cammed. We could go do a whole bunch more operations to get this much smoother um, and spend a lot of time coming up with the right operations just so that it, it gets the exact cut that we want. Um, I have a great example of something that I was working on um, 
while I'm still working on the misting setup so that we can do metal, um, I wanted to cut, uh, no, I don't want to use the backup recovery. Um, so I wanted to figure out, how would it be possible to cut out something like this? This is actually quite small and complicated. Um, so if I were to simulate this guy, you can see this is the, this is the bit. <laughs> um, so if we play this guy, I have, um, and I, I actually took the stock information from a piece of stock that I was going to order that would actually fit this coin in it. Um, and so this has to do a whole bunch of different operations to kind of cut all the different interesting cuts. And the, the idea was I was laying it out so that you could then flip it over and do the other side. Um, but it's doing like this crazy smoothing path on those curves to get it just right. And it's a good thing I wrote code. <laughs> well, it's the BK Makerspace logo. So, <laughs> um, but cut out on a little coin. And I wanted to make some, you know, like different different metal coins, like a bronze one and a, you know, aluminum one, stuff like that. So, but you can see this is going to take a really long time to cut because I went and like I used a ball or, you know, a round nose bit so that I would, I could get the nice smooth curves and all that. And this only cuts half of it. Now you got to flip it over, line it up exactly and do it again on the other side. Um, and I hadn't figured out how I was actually going to pull that off. Well, because again, you're going to flip it back over and cut the other side, and that should cut all the tabs off. Uh, but that, of course, part of the problem because once it cuts the tabs off, the whole thing is loose and goes flying. So you got to come up with some way to then secure it down on the other side, which is what I was still working out. Cut a negative of it or something. Floor tape. Does the library have a CNC? I did not know that. Nice. I didn't know the library had a CNC. You have to be aware of how you need to tape properly, otherwise you're gonna like you know, go rip your entire school toilet roll and that's kind of what's happening. Fair enough. So some that's my strong tape. Um Right, so we've got our crazy thing here. Now we wanna cut it out. We wanna take this and make it an actual physical thing because for some reason we need to make what appears to be a very strange planer. So we're going to take our very strange planer and we're going to post-process it. Uh, and for that, I have to no, I have to remember how to actually do that. Um, I believe we're over here. In, oh yeah, right. It's the giant thing that has G codes on it, the post-process button. So we hit this, and it says your folder doesn't exist because it never exists. And I say yes because I don't care. Um, and then it brings up a whole bunch of defaults. Now, I've got it set to Mach 3 mil, which is the defaults for Mach 3, um, which is the software we use on our CNC. But if you're using a different CNC, uh, I, do you know what the library one uses? Uh, like VCarve yeah. or something? Nomad. Nomad? Nomad's uh, not on. Uh, it might be. The software running on it is Mach 3. Is it Mach 3 there? So there's lots of different options for the software, um, including Linux CNC. Uh, there, here's a Linux CNC. Like, I don't know if you can read this, um, but so you've got lots of different options here. We are going to pick Mach 3 mil because if we don't, it won't work. Um, you can go in here and, and really mess with this um, and change a whole bunch of settings. If your particular CNC is strange or has weird dimensions or weird software, this is what I was talking about. There's an awful lot of code here. It's all very confusing looking and I don't understand how it works. So I don't recommend it. Okay, so my guess is um, that, hey, look at that, Carbide 3D. So you could use this for that, and it's got a post processor that should generate G code that that machine understands. So we do that, we say, yep, everything looks fine, I'm gonna call it, you know, thing one, and I'm going to post process it, um, which is going to save into this directory, which it cl claimed did not exist, yet it clearly does. And we're gonna save. And then we're going to wait. Not very long because there's our G code. Um, and this is gonna have an awful lot of stuff in it. This is all the, uh, so for those of you out 
here or out on the internet who are watching who don't know what G-code is, it's just a really simple way of describing tool paths to a CNC machine. Uh, if you ever, as a kid, uh, if you're as old as I am, uh, played the turtle game on the Apple IIe where you told the turtle how to draw, this is telling the turtle how to draw except the turtle is a high-speed bit. Yes. Yes. So yeah, logo, postscript, any of those languages are very similar uh, vector drawing. And this is just complicated vector drawing. Yeah. And, you know, turning on motors, moving here, turning off motors, etc. cetera. Um, so that's, yeah. that's it as far as on the machine. Um, now, for those of us here, we'll probably run in and at least start this and watch it, you know, be wrong. And so we have to come back and do this again. <laughs> but uh, I'd like to... Um, get this on a thing and so we can at least do that but it, um if we have any you know things we want to talk about before we do that or any questions or did i blow through this like i do everything and awesome. nobody knows what you're talking about <laughs> i did I, I i'm sorry i was asleep i didn't i didn't hear any of that uh <laughs> you want me to start from the beginning again right welcome to uh <laughs> no <laughs> so um, I'll just pull that back up just so that we can show it uh, for the people who are online. So by default, we're in model mode here. And so this right up here is the different modes you can switch into. Patch is the one where you can do crazy, more, more complicated surface modeling. Um, this one takes 3D designs and literally creates sheet metal cut plans for it. I've never used it, uh, but I'm told it's really cool. Um, you can also use it for making uh, paper models if you're crazy because those paper models have like 600 cuts and then you have to individually tape together 600 pieces of paper. But um, if you wanted to make something out of sheet metal and you had a, a design, that's what that's for. Um, but manufacturers what you want for the CAD or for CAM. Um, any other questions, comments, stuff for the stuff for the internet people? Any, any internet questions? I doubt it, but. So they have a lot of good tutorials on their website. Um, there's also a bunch of good tutorials by, oh God, I've already forgotten his name. He's one of the 3D printing guys. Uh, he's in Europe, Maker's Muse. Maker's Muse has a really, Australian. Yeah. See, uh, my mom would yell at me if she heard me say that. Same uh, thing. Yeah, they're all the same, right? Uh, and so <laughs> he, <laughs> right? Sorry, Europe. Sorry, Australia. Uh, <laughs> yep, well, you know. Anyway, uh, <laughs> he has a great series of tutorials on Fusion 360 uh, that cover all sorts of simple stuff as well as all, all of more complicated stuff. I think he even has some cam videos, which are great. So um, I am not an expert. Like I said, I'm, I'm just giving you a quick basic run through of how you would CAD and cam, and then hopefully we'll go literally turn on a machine and make a bunch of noise here in a minute. Um, which I'm, I'm sorry, internet, you don't get to watch. It's just how it is. You go, go, go look up CNC videos and just assume that those cool videos are what we're doing. And it, it'll work. Like, yeah, it's going to be perfect and not possibly dangerous. Anything else? Uh, I assume the no, no internet, uh, comments or questions. That's all right. <laughs> Maybe next time. Let me down, internet. Uh, just tell them like I see them. Anything else before we uh, adjourn to the uh, loud room? All right. Uh, well, you heard it here first. Uh, <laughs> well, really second, because you know. Yeah, well, all right. <laughs> yeah, you probably heard it here second. Let's not lie to ourselves. All right. I think we're. Uh, I think we're gonna stop here, unless anybody else has anything else, and then we'll. Uh, I'll go grab. Good old USB drives, and we'll make this happen. But uh, thank you everybody for coming. Um, I, I I feel awkward thanking B and K Makerspace, being yeah, one of the owners. So. Uh, well, thank, thank, thank me thank you for, uh, for <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, thank you, thank you Tecklahoma and, uh, uh, yeah, we'll see you guys next month, I guess.